I'm going to speak on translating adult humor in children's cartoons. And to start with, I'd like to pay to your attention to the definition of a G-rated motion pictures, picture, uh, as all cartoons I'm going to speak about are G-rated. Uh, so the American, that's why the definition is taken from filmratings.com. Uh, uh, so a G-rated motion picture should contain nothing in theme, language, nudity, sex violence, or other matters that would offend parents uh, whose young children view the motion pictures. Still, some snippets of language may, according to these uh, durated rules, may go beyond polite conversation, uh, but they are commonly everyday expressions. And no stronger words are present in durated motion pictures, and depictions of violence should be minimal. No nudity, sex scenes, or drug use are present in the notion motion pictures. So, uh, strictly speaking about, speaking about uh, rates uh, and uh, about curated uh, motion pictures, we definitely speak about censorship. And issues regarding censorship uh, and audiovisual translation altogether have been discussed by several authors. Dahlia Chari is one, Chiaro is one of them. And uh, according to this um, censorship, taboo terms and coarse language are uh, either suppressed or reduced in double dubbed version of films and allusion to promiscuity somehow are mitigated. And uh, in many countries, for example, in Italy, according to Bukharia, uh, the translators try to liberally tone down not only sexual references, but even terms of insult. So I have a 10 year old child and I've been involved into watching cartoons for five years. <laughs> And uh, that's why I've analyzed uh, 10 cartoons. Uh, the Boss Baby, Cars 1, 2, and 3, Hotel Transylvania 1 and 2, and Toy Story 1, 2, and 3. Uh, well, I'm somehow involved in the cartoons. And uh, um, I'm a slangist. I'm busy with slang mainly. And first, I was interested in slang in cartoons. And first, I wanted to spot phrases containing slang. Uh, substandard lexemes in general, slang and jargon. Uh, and further on, uh, I was interested in the translation and uh, analyzed the English source text together with Ukrainian source, uh, Ukrainian target, uh, to trace some translation strategies applied. So coming back to the definition of um, just this durated uh, picture, uh, they should contain nothing in theme, language, nudity, sex, or violence, or other matters. So, but are they? Uh, so first you see this, uh, her Dracula, uh, that is dressed like a nurse and does uh, a seductive rare and dance as he's folding the newly born infant. And is it appropriate for children to watch a drag performance? Well, not sure. Uh, perhaps so, if we lived in the society that is gender neutral, mm, uh, but this kind of comedy humiliates and pokes fun on um, at people who might choose to wear drag because they feel more truly like themselves in uh, drag. So if we put the drag aside, uh, why is this nurse wearing an extremely tight dress? Well, that's the question. Uh, then there are scenes of, uh, that are suggestive of child pornography. Well, a pack of young wolves there uh, eat the fur out of monster's legs. And he has red underwear uh, under his fur, uh, and the underwear shows an outline of his private parts. Uh, at least some of the wolves uh, chew on and over the monster's groin to get the fur off. And uh, they are kind of giving him oral in a giant orgy. Well, as you may see, the monster is not in pain uh, from whatever they, they are doing and only pretends to be embarrassed and attempts to cover the underwear. Uh, so considering that some young viewers might have been molested, the scene might make them feel as if molestation is normal and funny. Uh, again, Turning back to this definition, uh, scenes including sexual allusion are, are more often mitigated through manipulation of language and uh, 
still uh, these cartoons, these films may have some snippets of language. They may go b beyond polite conversation and the common everyday expressions, so they contain slang. And the quantity of slang terms in those cartoons are almost 500, so it's quite a number. And uh, uh, our hypothesis was uh, to um, trace adult, talked, uh, adult topics actualization through slang terms uh, used. Um, slang terms still not go beyond polite conversation and may be called uh, everyday expressions. As for methodology, uh, I've tried to, uh, to use an old school a component analysis is called semantic decomposition in Europe uh, and component analysis in our country. Uh, it has been applied both to source and target terms. And um, this strict component analysis could hardly be used to the whole vocabulary, but it's quite okay with slang terms since uh, the majority of them are not uh, polysemantic but still monosemantic. It's quite easy to, 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 to make this decomposition. And uh, what uh, the, the idea was to trace um, the linchpins for slang terms, the, the centers of attraction. And besides, this uh, decomposition is a reliable tool for translation studies, providing a more adequate uh, analysis of translation equivalence, according to NIDA. And um, uh, having scrolled through these slang terms, one may uh, think that uh, they are unsystematic and chaotic, so, say so, or unorganized. And we managed to define the slang terms as precisely as possible and um, uh, make an overall conclusion by mapping the semantic space of cartoons uh, as carved by slang terms. And it uh, appeared that the bigger part of uh, slang terms, almost 73% in the cartoons are human nominations. And uh, the biggest part of this human nomination are those that uh, refer to uh, limited intelligence or silly behavior. So they are mainly invectives, but still uh, they, they contain themes of some limited intelligence. So the reference to intelligence or the absence of it, uh, you may see some examples, uh, and all those terms are more or less about uh, people with limited intellectual abilities. Uh, so the quantity is big enough, so about 43% of all the stuff. The next point, again, taboo usually in the cartoons, uh, in durated films in general, uh, reference to religious feelings. So uh, the word holy, uh, as you know, um, is dedicated or devoted to the service of God, the church or religion, but its coinages are numerous and they perceived as profanity sometimes. So you see, may see here the examples from Toy Story, from Hotel Transylvania and from The Cause. And we have holy cow, holy guacamole, holy moly, guacamole, holy smokes, holy rabies, holy shoots. So it's quite productive, this holy. <laughs> and uh, besides, uh, the authors go so far as to par parody and satirize, for, for instance, Buddhism, as, uh, for example, in uh, Toy Story, when Woody struggles to pull Buzz out of the claw machine, and uh, the quote is, he has been chosen, he must go, hey, nirvana is coming. So nirvana is definitely about religion. So th the next point, uh, reference to race and nationality. Again, the quite a number uh, of um, scenes are about race and nationality. And the representation of race relations has always been problematic uh, in uh, cartoons. Now the situation is changing. Uh, the series of films have foregrounded a new approach to the, mm, to, to, to the portrayal of people of certain nationality. The most notable are perhaps Pocahontas or the princess and the frog. Uh, but interspecies relations, say so, interspecies uh, relations between vampires and humans in Hotel Transylvania are still reflected and mocked. Uh, it's notable that in Hotel Transylvania, the story climaxes with smooth indifferences. So the vampire marries a human and they have a child, um, but what makes our love is exactly their politically incorrect issues. So you are European, it's called deodorant, nothing like insulting the entire continent. So these are uh, uh, the, the, uh, 
the words of this lady, uh, the mother of a human who married a vampire. So it's again about race and nationality. Reference to gender. Again, the gender, uh, re uh, the gender representation uh, is not linear over time. And um, still, uh, we have here the remark of Barbie. I want to be with you, Ken. I do in your dream house. Please take me away from this. Take me away. So it's a, a kind of a conservative point of view. And uh, we have here another lady from Hotel Transylvania. And uh, she graduated business school and not going to, to cook uh, at home anymore. So the, the feminism is somehow mocked here. And the biggest part, of course, is um, referred to physiology. Uh, so human culture in general refers to physiology, to sexual relations, and so forth. And there's quite a number of jokes related to physiology. There's quite a number of slang terms that nominate uh, boobies, the butts, and all that stuff. Uh, here are some examples from different cartoons. So the reference to the uh, physiology is absolutely obvious. And moreover, uh, reference to sexual activity are present in cartoons. Um, I don't know if you see it or not. So we have here beefcake and pencil loaf. Uh, these are metaphor just the metaphoric model of uh, animal uh, of of food related to to sex somehow uh, is uh, used here. And it's interesting that it suits all categories. Uh, because for adults it's about sex, for kids it's about food. Mm -hmm. And um, the same goes with prancing pony, uh, pussy and pony in Madagascar. Again, uh, animal human uh, metaphor. And uh, the, child, the, the children uh, decode the, uh, the part that is associated with uh, animals and the, the adults, well, something else. And moreover, uh, in spite of the fact that sexual relations are and their the, the verbalization and uh, the uh, visual image is absolutely forbidden for durated films, but what do you think of it? Hotel Transylvania again. Uh, yes, I know it's your honeymoon. I apologize. Go back to doing what you are doing during the honeymoon. I mean, so. Uh, Again, about uh, about uh, the death, the same situation, but I want to speak on more on translation from uh, English into Ukrainian. So uh, it should be mentioned that when it comes to humor based on uh, taboo, uh, lexemes and topics, uh, the sauce is often mangled in translation. It's somehow mitigated, and uh, tr translators prefer not to use slang, but standard terms in spite of slang present in the source. Mm, and uh, mm, so the, the translators often resort to the neutralization of substandard. And it should be no noted, nevertheless, uh, that to describe the procedure to, of decoding the message of the source text and delivering it into a target, uh, it goes beyond mere picking up of semantical equivalent terms, of course, um, but at the same time, it facilitates translators and reviewers' task, uh, for instance, making quality assessment procedures to state that it, that is good. So this uh, equivalent theory works quite okay. So what is interesting in translation from English into Ukraine, from translation of the cartoons, uh, semantic contiguity, semantic equivalence is observed mm, in most cases. So in most cases, slant term was rendered as slant term into Ukrainian. 70% of 320 pairs, say so, uh, slant was um, translated as slang. And here are some examples, uh, just the target text Ukrainian. And back translation, you may see that it is more or less the same. And uh, as for neutralization or partial equivalence, the quantity is not big, so some 20% at most, uh, when uh, the slang term in uh, English was neutralized in the translation. So, and I tried to show it in back translation, so it's neutralized, it mitigated somehow. But the most interesting thing is this feminization in English Ukrainian translation. When in the source text we have quite a standard term uh, or terms, and in the translation there appears slang. So they appear substandard language, appear slang and jargon, uh, and it's uh, quite um, uh, common with funcepts when uh, it's about uh, non-professional translation. 
but uh, we've analyzed the official version, the official translation. And in the official version, the official version seems to be um, funnier even. And it's, uh, it looks more substandard than the source one. And uh, the quality of the examples of uh, disfemization in Ukrainian is it's amazing. It's quite, quite a number. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I'd like to, to comment some some of them, because it's difficult with Ukrainian, maybe. Um, so we have baby Jesus, just absolutely standard in the source, and we have uh, version 2.0 in Ukrainian. Uh, we have here uh, some um, to, to go um, mad, Zirvati Bashnyun in Ukrainian, to make crazy. And um, the translator has successfully retained the semantic meaning of uh, this source, uh, text, text source slant term, but uh, the social stylistic component has been added to make the statement even lower. And uh, moreover, we have here the last example uh, to do everything, just a standard term, nothing special in the source. And we have Natsirla uh, Bihate that is taken from criminal jargon, strictly speaking, from prison jargon. And uh, it, it's been used and it was quite a success. It aroused laughter. Um, so that is somehow different from uh, the ordinary state of thing. That's why I wanted to share it, uh, maybe to discuss what is going on here. My hypothesis is that um, this disfemization is due to the special, very special status of Ukrainian language um, because it's been oppressed by uh, Russian language in my country and um, uh, centuries of national language oppression translated into its marginalization. So it lacked uh, somehow popular folk or humor culture that it, it existed, but it's been perceived as primitive and attenuated, old one. So not modern, not fashionable. And the translators try to cope with it, try to make uh, their language alive and full of expressions uh, that uh, may be funny, may be interesting, may be expressive. And that's why they prefer using, mm, uh, they prefer to make the text uh, more substantive than it used to be in the source. And uh, mm, according to some scholars, to Diacintas, to uh, Sabel Beasco, yeah, yeah, Patrick, I know <laughs> from Barcelona, yeah. Uh, uh, so the, this um, growth of products translated into national language is usually a mark of national self-determination, and the quantity of Ukrainian translation is bigger and bigger and bigger, as, and it's becoming more substandard, and let's hope for the better for demarginalization of the language. Thank you very much. You mean the visibility, the increase of visibility of translator? Yeah. No, 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 no. No, like, uh, for example, there's been a shift, there's been a slight change, if, if I uh, maybe I wasn't uh, reading correctly, but coming with the idea of Baby Jesus 2.0 mm -hmm. was not part of the original. Yeah. Well, uh, sorry, was it? Was it? No, 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 no so it that's wasn't. My, yeah. That's my point. It's the, 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 fact, the fact that they went a little further was it to make Ukrainian yeah, 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 yeah. Even more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, so it is much more than just merely translation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a kind of adaptation, you mean? Yeah. Oh, yeah. At least intensification of Yeah, 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 yeah. Because it's unrelated to Ukrainian culture. 
No, no, it's not true. No, 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 no. So it's related just to, to make uh, people laugh, I think, even more. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because there was a robotic compensation because something was missed before and they were trying to achieve uh, I don't know, a higher degree of cinema at that point. Mm. But all in all, the, the, the translation is quite accurate. So I traced line by line and it was mm -hmm. quite, quite a thing. Just uh, oh. the translation was just, the, the, these were the, this was the professional translation out of Franz Sapp's then something that is done uh, regularly to, to have some fun. Mm -hmm. Well, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I know that's generally the case. Uh, it seems to me Sintas or Chalmers, uh, so somebody uh, was doing a paper on fun subs and yeah. Uh, yeah. everything that worked for sans fun subs so just worked perfectly for the official translation. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> official version, <laughs> well. Yeah, but if uh, so, before the war, this Russian-Ukrainian war, uh, mm -hmm. we had the possibility to to see Russian version or Ukrainian version, ah. and people preferred the Ukrainian version because it was funnier. Oh. Ah. Well, it was not due to ideology then. Now it's obviously so, but uh, but um, then it was due to the better quality. Mm -hmm. That was just my question. Mm -hmm. Not all of them, but I've seen Shrek, Shrek it seems to me, uh, and uh, some um, uh, Shrek. Do you know Shrek? Or, and also uh, the, the cartoon uh, uh, with uh, Sirnik Buksirnik, um, it's been about cars. And cars, cars, ca cars, cars. <laughs> those cars, yeah. And that was definitely a different translation. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Uh, they do, <laughs> especially if it turns to, if we speak about industrial translation, they really do. So we can save money, well, and time. Okay. No, no, no. Well, they do what they want, really, on <laughs> translators. Well, okay, thank you. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to read. I'm very sorry for this, but it, there are so many things that um, I feel I can't do it otherwise. Um, right. Um, let's see. Apart from the media uh, analyzed by Schaffner and Basnet in 2010, two other mechanisms uh, play a decisive role in constructing or deconstructing imaginary collective identity on its three levels, departure society, arrival society, and diaspora self-mirrored. One is social media, of course, a spaces for daily permanent uh, interaction. The other is artistic production, literature in particular. Diasporic identities are permanently reconstructed in literary works written by diaspora authors, defined, for instance, by Vernier as double self-translators but also in texts written in the country of origin and translated often by diaspora translators. In 1990, Basnet and Lefebvre remarked the power of translations in constructing cultural identities and in projecting strong images of writers, texts, and cultures. Starting from this uh, premise, I will present a cross-cultural uh, project, Puppets Across the Border, uh, which uh, entailed translating children's theater from Romanian into Spanish and touring the performance through several Spanish cities. 
I led the team of four translators, undergraduates at the University of Alicante, all second generation Romanian migrants, who had difficulties, of course, with ethnographic information, lexis, archaisms, regionalisms in Romanian, yeah? and idioms. My discussion starts from this project based on children's literature and aimed at a better understanding between host society and income population from an intercultural uh, perspective, uh, that is, uh, collective growth yeah, based on mutual exchange, instead of a multicultural approach yeah, uh, understood as a mosaic of uh, ethnic groups cohabiting but not communicating. Um, theater is one of the most potent tools for mutual knowledge, and according to Tamez, the best means to introduce children into humor by distancing them from their egocentric self. In my intervention, I will try to approach the complex issue of humor translation in page-to-page -page and page-to-stage processes in the puppet show Donde Esta Mi Saquito? Where is my purse? Translated for a mixed audience made up of, this was the most difficult, yeah? Um, a mixed audience made up of Spanish and Romanian children and adults. So, <laughs> um, let's see. The show is based on a popular tale collected and narrated by Jon Kranga, a Romanian author of the 19th century, labeled as the children's writer par excellence. Um, unlike literary or learned tales, which are conceived individually with a clear authorship, transmitted in written form and in a single version, um, popular tales are told by a narrator who has collected and adapted them, preserving their structure, plot, and key action. They are described as oral, traditional, fictional, multi-version tales, uh, subdivided into fairy tales, tales of animals, and tales of customs. Um, Where is my purse? Is an animal tale with a moral. Uh, the old woman, greedy and selfish, eats all the eggs laid by her hen and tells her neighbor, the old man, to beat his rooster so that he lays eggs too. Instead, the man sends the rooster away, who finds a purse with two coins, but it is stolen from him by a greedy landowner. He insists in getting the purse back, and he is drowned in a well, roasted in an oven, locked in the treasury, but still demanding his purse. He finally returns to the old man's house laden with um, riches. The envious um, old woman sends her hand to fetch the same fortune, yeah, which she cannot, so she is beaten to death in the written text, in the written text, by her mistress, not in the stage version, though, in which the man is generous and <laughs> shares his wealth with the old woman. Um, the unhappy ending from literature is repaired on stage uh, through a symmetrical marriage, and the two couples, human and animal, uh, live happily um, ever after. Um, the team of um, translators had to examine the initial popular story, uh, watch the Romanian performance to see the kinesics, proxemics, nonverbal, and paralinguistic elements, and only afterwards could they translate the Romanian script. From the translator's viewpoint, the text presented the difficulty of a dual language of children's literature, the artistic language containing um, symbols, archaisms, collocations. Um, this doesn't work. <laughs> oh, this was, I had a photograph here, but it doesn't seem to... Yeah. Come on. Oh, he's so, it's so slow. Um, and children's language, including reiterations, time adverbs, um, an impressionistic tinge, a fixed order of events, and an open logic beyond reality, since there is no verification of truthfulness in this kind of uh, text, uh, but only uh, an internal coherence. On the other hand, the translators face the double convention of the theatrical genre, page and stage constraints. 
um, humor, an element scarcely present in the original tale, was added in the stage production. The play contains a number of textual and stage elements responding to different types of humor, which I broadly classified into, uh, into four categories. Yeah? Uh, literary stylistic, visual auditive, behavioral, and situational contextual. Literary stylistic. In this category, um, I included um, the literary style as identified by a Romanian author, Vrabie, who wrote this beautiful book in, back in 1975, uh, The Poetical Structure of um, Fairy Tales. Um, and um, he includes there an expressive style, monologues, names, opening and closing formulae, context style, dialogues, repetitions, in-text formulae, uh, and a referential style, which has to do with universals such as antitheses or parallel structures. Regarding this expressive style, uh, the strategy um, that seems to prevail is adaptation, of course. Um, here, it implies, of course, domestication. Uh, and I have an example with names that uh, in this um, um, uh, play acquired the status of dramatis personae, yeah? um, although they are um, um, common names. Yeah? Uh, and I have Mosh Baba in Romanian, uh, translated by uh, Viejo Vieja, because we had no uh, equivalence. Yeah? Mosh Baba in Romanian is rural, is fairy tale, is family, is colorful, yeah? and it's more likely to produce humor uh, than the normal. Batrin Batrina would be in Romanian, Batrin Batrina, which would be uh, Viejo Vieja. Um, these words uh, are, we can find them in collocations, for, in, in collocations, for instance, Baba Cloanza, the Wicked Witch, or Moș Crăciun, Father Christmas. Yeah? Uh, so, as Basnet uh, explains in her book translation, there are things that simply cannot be reproduced. <laughs> so, if Basnet says so. <laughs> um, Concerning the contact um, style, an important role is played by the in-text formulae. For instance, the expression cucurigu boyer mari, that's cuckle doodle doo, great nobleman, uh, which uh, is the leitmotif of the play, uh, was translated by the equivalent onomatopoeic kikriki, followed by the domesticated senorito. <laughs> Uh, both elements are meant to create humor, a humorous effect together with the diminutive and the rhyme that um, is the second part of this formula. Um, then dialogue and repetition also fall into this second um, uh, category. The dialogue between the landowner and his servant is representative. The letter's discourse contains repetitions of lexis and structure, paralinguistic elements like pauses, um, fillers. He uses a lot of um, or uh oh, <laughs> and together with the intonation and pitch. Um, and the convergence of all this uh, makes uh, those humorous, wow, humorous effects. <laughs> um, the third axis is the referential uh, style, uh, which regards universals, yeah? And here we have antagonistic uh, characters. Um, their behavior, their parallel development, and eventually the gender stereotype. Uh, children's literature rests on archetypal structures. As in Universal Tales, Cinderella, Snow White, in Romanian tales, the female element is ambivalent. Either as victims or executioners, women compete for men's attention. And in a genre till recently mainly authored by men, they are associated with treachery, malice, sadism. Uh, when they appear in opposition to males, the rooster bringing back innumerable riches and the hen who pathetically brings back a glass bead, the antagonist pattern always favors the male element. He is hungry. She is heartless. Both performances, and you can see her, uh, I don't know, yeah. <laughs> um, both performances, the Romanian and the Spanish, uh, maintain the gender stereotype, although, as I said, they avoid death and soften animal mistreatment compared to the uh, written tale. Visual auditive. Um, 
Espasa uh, recommends separate treatment to music on stage. Her options for songs in plays are incorporating or omitting music, humming, creating a new song. As we have seen, the translator's choice in this case was to keep the tune and translate the lyrics with rhyme and metrics. Why? Because the whole spectacle had folkloric Romanian music as a backbone. In fact, any Romanian listener would immediately recognize the tune. Um, the song is used um, instead of an opening and closing formula because we deal with a circular type of narration. The adventure starts and ends in the same setting after the fantastic trip. Um, the humorous effect of the song, a satire of the, the old woman greedy and mean, uh, is created both by the form, easy rhymes, and by the content, the old woman eating eggs at all times, cooked in every possible way, praising the country's life, while the old man with an empty belly is not so fond of it. And you see the man. Do I have... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> um, the most difficult task for translators was to preserve both sense and rhyme without excessively extending the verse uh, or missing the humor, right? For instance, the recurrent formula in Romanian, foie verde, uh, followed by the name of a plant, um, um, is meant to guarantee the rhyme with whatever comes next. Here, translators foreignized the target version uh, through a literal translation, hojas verdes, followed by any plant that would comply with the prosodic requirement in Spanish. At the beginning, we had azalea, aldea, yeah? And here we have, I don't know, uh, pino, campesino. <laughs> um, the idiosyncratic element is opaque for Spanish audience, whereas for Romanian diaspora, it represents an identity sign, as well as the visual clues, uh, the costumes, the countryman costumes, the landowner, uh, the landowner's moustache, the village architecture, etc. Uh, on the other hand, the translation of the contents opts for domestication when adopting the various uh, egg dishes, including tortilla. Uh, the country woman's desire to live in the city and have facilities is represented by the word cuveta, this is fregadero, sink, um, suggesting running water, a progress indicator, uh, which the translator intensifies into lavavajillas, dishwasher. <laughs> A stronger emancipation sign. Yeah, so there we, di we did what uh, Jesus uh, 2.0, uh, uh, so we, co we co-created, uh, yeah? <laughs> we went beyond ethics. <laughs> Um, so uh, the, the clash between the bucolic agrarian atmosphere of the song lyrics and the unexpected image of a dishwasher produces a humorous effect, yeah? mainly in adults, <laughs> I have to say. Uh, let us look a bit at the song. <laughs> When the lyrics were ready, one of the translators, who is a singer, sang them in Spanish for the puppeteers, who are Romanian uh, and didn't speak any Spanish, to imitate pronunciation, syllable division, stress, so you could hear that the result was quite good. <laughs> okay. Um, behavioral humor. <laughs> the third category refers to characters' behavior. In the, first, in, the, in the tale, the landowner's servant is slow in all his actions. He answers in a silly way, on a hilarious voice, and he's very clumsy. He even engages in a guignol-like fight with a cook, a gypsy woman with caricatural features, also supposed to create humorous, a humorous effect. Here, foreignizing is present, not in the text, but in the preservation of the original stage uh, semiotic uh, codes. 
situational humor. Um, situational humor is present through a clash between expectations and reality. The rooster's resilience, no matter how hard the landowner tries to kill him. Repeating stubbornly his catchphrase, even in gargles when he survives the drowning. <laughs> Provides laugh, of course, among the children. Uh, and I have an example here. <laughs> Page-to-page process starts from an interlinguistic translation of a script based on um, the well-known tale, coping with difficulties of a pragmalinguistic, cultural, and communicative nature, avoiding, for instance, sounds that Romanian puppeteers couldn't pronounce. Um, followed by a page-to-stage intersemiotic translation which adapts stage signs and puppetry codes from one audience to another to obtain a product which is accessible to Spanish audience but also still recognizable as an identity exponent in the eyes of the Romanian community in Spain. Uh, when migrating um, texts as human beings, undergo acculturation, seen as the domestication of the cultural other, uh, says Venuti. Yeah? Uh, inevitable when dealing with playtex, says Altonen. Uh, however, Pasqua uh, observed that since the 90s, a shift had taken place in the translation of children's literature, namely the tendency towards foreignizing that replaced a long tradition of domesticating such texts. As an illustration, the title, Punguza Kudoi Bani, the purse with two coins, was, was bound to optimum rendition of the rhyme, Kukurigu Boyer Mar Das Punguza Kudoi Bani, by Kikiriki Senorito Donde Esta Mi Saquito. <laughs> Great nobleman, cuckle doodle do, give back my purse and the two coins too. So I did it in English also, so I'm a great poet, you must, you must observe. Um, <laughs> So this is how the purse with two coins turned into an interrogation. Donde esta mi saquito? Uh, this translation can be regarded as foreignizing on grounds of its reference to the original formula that named the tale in Romanian. So regarding Pasqua's uh, observation, indeed the translation of the theatrical product for children denotes an increased presence of foreignization compared to previous versions. We have previous versions from Romanian into English, from Romanian into Spanish, back in the 70s and in the 80s um, of the last century. <laughs> <laughs> my century. Uh, nevertheless, domestication still occupies an important place, perhaps because adaptation remains one of the main translation techniques for this uh, genre. And I'm just going to take two minutes. Oops. Ooh. Sorry. It's two minutes. Um. <laughs> Oye, cochero, a ver qué quiere ese gallo. ¿Qué quiere aquí, señorito? ¿Dónde está mi saquito? No sé qué quiere que no para de cantar. Uh, oh, ¿qué quiere aquí, señorito? ¿Dónde está mi saquito? Pero no vuelves a hacerle caso, Fontainas. Cógelo y tíralo a este pozo que no quiero volver a oírlo.
se ha hecho un poco grande. Abre la puerta, idiota. ¿Cómo quieres que entre con la puerta cerrada? Mételo de cabeza. Hace más fuerza. funny also yeah <laughs> with my students teach Romanian so um, Romanian is a is a is not a uh, <laughs> widely spoken language so we do all kind of tricks to <laughs> attract people <laughs> and we are we <laughs> translated the original so the, the, the written text was translated by me and of course this uh, project was uh, was in in, in a, in a uh, greater thing yeah, in, a, in a wider thing uh, which was a collaboration with the Romanian Institute uh, cultural Institute so so the so the so the, uh, the play was already um, done like that in Romania that it, it had been played like that in Romania with this text with this script so it was a play that uh, uh, won, uh, had won awards, so it was loved by, the, by, by audiences. Now, the, the real story is uh, from the 19th century, so it needed some kind of updating. Uh, she kills the, the hen because the hen cannot be as good as the um, rooster. Um, and, and she beats the, the hen and... and, and uh, 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 advises him to beat <laughs> to beat the rooster too. So it's it's violence. It's uh, 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 it's <laughs> uh, gender uh, uh, stereotype. It's ethnotype. The, the ethnotype with the with the gypsy. We didn't have time to talk about that. But the gypsy is another issue, a huge issue to talk about in another presentation. Um, and all those things, I think. Uh, people in the th uh, in Romania, uh, something that I didn't have time to say is that in Romania we have a very uh, deeply rooted tradition of uh, theaters for children. This comes from the communist from the communist. Maybe Ukraine has the same thing. Uh, communist period gave uh, gave us this you know uh, special uh, theaters for children because uh, theater uh, had to educate. Yeah, in communism. It was, it was not entertaining, it was educational, yeah? <laughs> so we had, nowadays in Romania, there are 23 uh, children theaters. So I mean, only for children, only with ch children uh, repertoire. 
So it's this tradition, and they feel free to adapt texts, to update things, and then we receive the script. Of course, I had to work with my students on the, on the original story because they had to know what happened there and which the, uh, the, the, the values and, and, and the words and everything, yeah, the, the, the whole cultural background. But we translated from the script. And the script was already cleaned, you know, censored, as, uh, as Catalina said. Uh, there was a censorship there that, uh, in that upta updating, yeah? So we worked with the, with the script. So um, I'm not to blame. I think that unfortunately they read less and less Kranga in original mm -hmm. because Kranga comes from a region of Romania, Moldova, mm -hmm. um, with and uses so many regionalism, not just from Moldova but from his own village. So it's such a restricted area. He uses uh, words from there. So I need to take the dictionary, to look up in the dictionary some words. So you can imagine people from um, young generations would have to look up in the dictionary those, those terms. So they yeah, read less and they will... I, I can understand and they will, and they will probably read updates of, 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 those, of those tales. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> Revisited, let's say, yeah, let's say revisited. <laughs> Uh, we did another one in 2013, so if we have a new uh, um, um, uh, conference on humor, I can bring, <laughs> I can <Okay>. bring more. <laughs> but now, not, not at the, the time being. Where are students now? Where are they? <laughs> They, uh, the, the p people who translated this one uh, are already graduates, so they, I hope they um, found a job and everything. <laughs> uh, but uh, normally they keep in touch. I mean, um, students in Romanian language keep in touch with, with, uh, with, with, with the university, and um, each time we organize some, some uh, cultural events, they are invited, they are invited and they, and they participate, and Kalla knows, so... Um, <laughs> But uh, people are very special. Students who, who take Romanian are special are very special because they um, look for uh, something deeper than the than the stereotype. So I mean, it's because it's not uh, yeah. Um, the Romanian diaspora has this also this um, and, and yeah this uh, wrapping yeah. So they go beyond and they are uh, really some of them really. Uh, I, um, I have several. Uh, former students who now work in Bucharest as translators um, and some of them even as interpreters and use their Romanian language uh, as, a, as a passive language, but they use it. So they get to use it in four years um, for, for you know, a uh, four-year course. Mm -hmm. yeah. Which is also, yeah, the advantage is that is, it is a Latin language. But it has declensions, it has a very complicated syntax, but uh, um, they, lo they do a wonderful, wonderful job. I'm very proud of my students. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay, very good. So first of all, um, it's a very hard act to follow both of my colleagues. Um, Thank you very much for your presentation. And thank you very much, Carla, and the University of Alicante for giving me a chance to, sorry, I don't know, is it, is it on? Oh, sorry, uh, sorry, so thank you very much for the, the opportunity to, oh, fine, fine, thank you, <laughs> for the opportunity to be here to tell my tale of wool, basically, because um, uh, unlike uh, most of the presentations that I, I'm, I have the pleasure to, to see during this Congress, most of the speakers brought uh, corpora or brought uh, percentages or studies, even pupillometry, something that I never thought I was going to witness or studies going towards. Then the next step is pupillometry. Uh, but in the, in the title of my presentation, I think that is basically a statement or an SOS saying we're in need of help because in interpreting studies, 
there is almost nothing. And I'm going to be very egocentric, egotistic, like children in this case. I'm going to be talking about my combination of languages, which is English into Spanish. So that's enough said. Uh, how many Englishes are there in the world? I mean, we use English as a lingua franca to begin with. So imagine compounding all that when we talk about humor. Many times we can find speakers who make the, great, the greatest effort to transmit something that sounds in their original mother tongue like very fun, and they try to convert it directly into English to make it sound like a humorous remark. So that compounds the difficulties that we are actually have to witness every time we enter the booth. We really don't know. Uh, even no matter how hard we try, we may not be 100% certain about what that person really meant to say or was trying to say. So as I'm saying, this is a, a, a statement. It, it, we have a, a lot to go, a, lo a long way to go. But obviously, um, this is something that needs debate. So I would like to ask my colleagues, any of you students, uh, practitioners, to, to uh, provide your insights or suggestions or directions. Because I don't know if you agree with this, but my perception as a person who, ha who I, I, I never, it never crossed my mind that I was going to study humor, per se. Um, I just plummeted into this uh, research during my class. Uh, one of my students asked me, okay, they were interpreting Europe Day presentation, uh, uh, a speech, very long speech, 15 minute speech that a native speaker had to present and that I had uh, written sort of taking ideas from Jorge Semprún in Buchenwald and Picasso painting for the Paris exhibition Guernica and then antagonistic uh, visions of Europe is not so great. I mean, a little bit of everything. And I said, okay, after all these impressionistic ideas about Europe in Europe's day, uh, let us end up with something more light. Let's, let's end up on a lighter note, a hu on a humorous note. And I don't know why uh, I took some lines from, I see young, very young people here, maybe you can tell me that Benny Lewis is a very famous Irish blogger, not idea. But I took some this this uh, expressions of a young student, as most of our students who had been abroad, who had felt what it is like to be European outside Europe, and the, he was making fun of those people that had tried to make fun of him. I mean, they, we were talking about stereotypes. So you're Irish, right? Then you're a drunkard, right? Then then you can buy your bow, right? Then then you only eat potatoes. But if you, if you don't know, I'm a teetotaler, and I came my plane, and, and I don't like potatoes, then you're an Irish, right? So that, that was, those were the type of comments that he made. I mean, humor uh, at its most basic form, irony. I mean, it was no pun intended. It was, not, it was not a matter of context. The context was very clear. So what happened was that uh, one of the most brilliant students I ever had the pleasure to <laughs> to be in company with her, I'm not saying I'm, I was teaching her, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm using the her as a neutral in English, right? I'm not saying whether it's a boy or a girl. Uh, was absolutely incapable of interpreting a thing. And then I talked to this person later and said, what had happened? And this person basically said, I didn't know how to do that. And uh, first of all, then she made me reflect, this person made me reflect about the fact that I don't know why I took for granted that anybody is capable of interpreting humor. I mean, even if it's irony. And then, but it took me years to find out, as Atardo has said this morning, that there is a difference between humor competence and, and humor performance. Um, so that led me to say, okay, let's go into Persheka. Let's go and see what Daniel Gil has to say about this. Let's see what Sergio Viaggio has to say about this. And there was nothing to be found. Uh, comments on what they have done. And um, I have to say that I'm a bit bothered about this because, for example, I love one writing about Paula Allendo. I think it's her, her name, is a blog. And she really vividly describes how terrible it was having to do sousotage a whole night for a stand-up comedi comedy for one particular customer in Argentina. So I want to die. It's just like, that's utterly impossible. 
Um, so um, I'm, I'm going to explain that later on if I have the time, because I always digress. I, I had a lot of things prepared and ready, but uh, I know that always things uh, run naturally. So please ask me later if, if you see that I skip something. The point was that when my student asked that, I didn't know how to do that. It should ha I should have been aware of that before I started preparing that Europe, Europe mock conference. And I didn't even thought about it. Hadn't it been because of her, thanks to her, I wouldn't be six years later now here today <laughs> trying to finish, uh, or it's going to kill me. My, my, uh, I don't know who's going who's gonna to win in this battle, my thesis or myself, my dissertation or myself. I don't know who's going to kill who. But um, um, I'm still wondering exactly, that's the problem. In uh, interpreting studies, there are no uh, guidelines to follow. There, there, there are no precepts. There are just ideas, general idea. Please laugh. The speaker is making a joke. How many of you have used that as practitioners? Maybe, maybe you have, right? SOS. That's, that's an SOS. That's the best and the, the only thing I can do. But actually, I haven't seen it anywhere. I, I, um, to the best of my logic, of my, of my knowledge, I may be, of course, wrong and, uh, and uh, faulty, but in all this time, I haven't found a single line on, is that the only thing we can do? Is that the only, the only or the most correct way to, um, to interpret? Maybe it's the only feasible one. But I think that uh, there is a lot of uh, research that, that can take place. And the problem is that, as it comes with humor, a person like me who was not into the humor business just uh, from the start in research terms, I don't know if you agree, but the, there is a discrepancy. And the problem is that even if you try to explain this to students, they may look at you like saying, what's the point? I know what humor is. I don't need any specific uh, uh, reflection on humor because I practice, I live humor. We all are humorous animals, or we... we, we uh, see that, yeah, th that is supposed to be the oldest joke ever recorded in Sumeria and, pff, and prior, quite probably. I don't know, Australopithecus, and, and uh, I don't know who else was cracking jokes as well, P probably through mimicry or something like that. But the point is that uh, there is a great discrepancy between experiencing humor and studying humor, humor as a matter of research. So that's why, while this gap continues, generally speaking, I think that those of us researching on humor studies are going to feel like um, nobody understands us, or there is always a, lo a long way to go, probably uh, due to that discrepancy. And uh, also, of course, is the bad name, the bad reputation that researching uh, humor generally has. Oh, I don't know if it's real, but that's at least what I've read, starting from Freud. <laughs> Freud says in, in his uh, main book about jokes and, and, uh, and interpretation of well, whatever of jokes, uh, he says that he plucked up the courage to research on humor after reading somebody else. By the way, it was not uh, Bergson. But, but, you know, so it's just like you always have to be brave to say, there is something going on here. There is a lot to discuss. There is a lot to talk about. Why are we not doing it? Um, but, of course, this is very is this easier said than done because sometimes our cultures, and, for example, I'm looking at my colleague here from Japan that I've been, I have the pleasure to meet, and I don't know whether uh, her conceptions coming from her culture are similar to the, the ones that we have in the Western world. It is... Uh, acknowledge that in the Western world, our perception, our negative perception towards humor comes directly from the Bible. Because if the Bible says that only uh, stupid people or mean people laugh, then, I mean, <laughs> or in, um, uneducated people laugh. So to cut a long story short, uh, we have another problem, those of us studying humor, that I have so many times to go back to Bergson or Freud, for the life of me, I couldn't understand that thing. I've read it like three times, and I'm still getting lost. I, I can follow his idea because I have no idea about psychology, philosophy, or anything in general. Um, and at other times, what you see are people that are kind of left aside, like Kessler and his idea of association, which to me is like a pinnacle of absolutely everything. And you see that not, not, it's not always mentioned. In any event, um, luckily now we are in a very different mood. Now we have humorous studies, not called like that by everybody, not acknowledged by everybody. 
uh, humorology is what my head apte says that it's called others say it's comic studies irony studies oh my god in any event associations for example like this I am proud of, of being a member um, are kind if you don't mind me put in this, this comparison, are the United Nations of, of humor, in the sense that we do not only speak different languages, but we come from different scientific backgrounds. And uh, normally we have to use English to communicate as a lingua franca. But as it happens in the United Nations, and I'm thinking, for example, about India and Pakistan, <laughs> for example, <laughs> if we're talking about Kashmir, uh, there, there are clashes. I mean, we are not starting from the same point of view. Therefore, sometimes debates are more than heated, or it's just like, no, you, what this person is saying from this field makes no sense whatsoever. So it's, it's very much like the United Nations. Uh, so we come to a point where actually, things that uh, in the field are taken for granted or finally agreed upon, then it doesn't take a long time for other experts to say, hmm, that's debatable. And I think that everybody's right. That's the point. Everybody has a point as long as it follows a scientific uh, approach in Popperian terms, such as th this can be falsified. Okay, I present my hypothesis, let's see if it works or not. So, two quantum leaps uh, related directly to um, um, interpreting studies. Linguistics, this is the right place to say that, <laughs> right? Raskin, Atardo, all the knowledgeable resources. I mean, but how can I apply that into interpreting studies? Can I? The question is, it. can I? Do I have to use that and insert it into what I'm studying? I think that it is, it's wonderful what uh, Raskin, uh, sorry, what Atardo said this morning, because that's a point. It is not about taking one thing that has been agreed upon and replicating it as if it were a converser. I'm going to change pounds into euros. <laughs> I use this, and it's going to work. So no, I think that each and every one of our different fields need to finesse, need to go directly to what they mean. Well, this is something, this is uh, the newest version in uh, Gurillo's uh, summary. So, in any event, we have to be very careful about our theoretical principles, maybe not theories. <laughs> maybe we, we cannot be that, uh, how to say, um, to aspire to that much, but let's try to, to find our own ways. Or, well, think about distinguishing. To me, it was a life changing event. When Graham Richard told in a conference where I attended for the first time, the, it was the first time that I had it. it was, he, it's not his, uh, it's not the first time this is uh, defined as such. But he said that either we are into the ontology of humor, whether humor is different from witticism, from comic, from ludicrous, from that's off humor. But what I do is I study about humor, meaning to say the intersection of humor into my own field, which is totally different. Then I don't have to concern about whether it is sarcasm, irony, sarcastic irony, <laughs> or things like that. And the second quantum leap, of course, comes into in, in, in the, uh, embodied in this uh, book that's a really life-changing event. Not the first time that someone has reflected upon humor and translation, of course not. But it's the first time where you have people from so many different areas of uh, uh, research, and they bring their voices not only about how they translate humor. Books in, uh, humorous books or hum books where there is humor have forever been translated. That's not the problem. It is the first time that, sci that, that uh, let me say, scientists, specialists on translation, explain, translate what is the, um, the protocol they have followed, what have been their ideas, how they have tackled that, which is really, really makes a difference. It's a life-changing uh, uh, event. But as translation is progressing and moving on, now this is the perfect place to talk about this. You are in audiovisual and cartoon uh, translation. You, you, you have your own protocols. You have your tags. I envy you so much because you have your categories. You have your tags. Look at the music, whether there is a drawing. There is no a drawing. Drawing and text, only a text. How do You have reflected so much about that that uh, personally, I believe this is from Trayan, Trayan Shipley Young from Madrid. Um, I believe that it is something similar that we have to do uh, look at this example, maybe those of you who are familiar with Spain. 
know that this is a, this is a, uh, this is a sign interpreter. Uh, and all these people over there, not only are very knowledgeable in several uh, things, but they are comedians, most of them. So they interpret for two hours consecutive. I mean, all the time. They, they, there's a group of a team of people, but all the time. They're interpreting all the time. So I'm sure that they have their needs that are going to be different from the needs I am focusing on in my dissertation, because I'm uh, f primarily focusing on simultaneous conference interpreting, which is not the only type of interpreting that exists. So I know that I'm going to have specific needs in my uh, in my uh, specific field, but what about if we find that in community or court interpreting? Probably the needs or the strategies or the things that you have to measure are going to be different than the ones I am generally uh, thinking of because nobody cares about who's at the bottom of the room. We're just here in the booth, so people only look at you if things go wrong. <laughs> if not, they don't care. So in this same number, it is the first time that no more and no less than Peshakra with uh, Pavlicek uh, presented a um, quantitative uh, study on uh, how often have you found humor while you were interpreting in uh, political scenarios, in, in um, yeah, official scenarios, and interpreters responded sometimes 60%, meaning to say that none of them said never. You see, the important part of this presentation is that, that of that of that uh, chart is that nobody says I've never encountered uh, humor and this is German English English German both ways the result was that German speaking people uh, seem to use less humor than English speaking people in the presentation but but in any event look at the look at the figures so that's really telling and now the problem we have problem is not a problem, is a typical dichotomy. On the one hand, we have James Nolan. Both of these books are, it, it, it has been very hard to find something where you actually find humor included, so I have to thank both of them. I, I don't want you to get me wrong. But this is the, the, the typical dichotomy that actually leads us nowhere. These are both extremes. James Nolan says, it is not possible to interpret humor. So fine, then why are you including the chapter? on humor if it's impossible, right? Well, no, never mind. And on the other hand, uh, Valerie Taylor Bulladon, Australian, by the way, I don't know if that's important, but I like to say it. She's Australian. She says, uh, not to interpret humor is a technical surrender. OK, fine, thank you. But in any event, if you try to fold both of them, what are the techniques that they are proposing? What is there is no proposal whatsoever. So it's just like, okay, you're very smart people, you're wonderful, I admire you very much, but it doesn't help me. Because again, I'm thinking about conference interpreting uh, um, context, but I'm also thinking from the pedagogical point of view. I want to teach students not, not to, uh, I don't know, to make something uh, out of the blue. I, is it time? No, I can, it's one minute. Okay, so I know that uh, humor may be no laughing matter. It may be hard to swallow at times, at times. Uh, I'm not saying that uh, it, or, um, only, it can only be a difficult thing, but we need to, you know, be able to drink it like water at times when it is possible. But when, what can we do when it is not the case? What are the proposals? So, to cut a long, a long story short, uh, what I'm doing right now is the idea is to, to try and see whether the categories taken from audiovisual translation and cartoon translation that are so deeply entrenched and studying, of course, they are, they're evolving, but see how much can I really use into uh, categorization of maybe possible uh, scenarios for uh, conference interpreting in simultaneous. And of course, English and Spanish. Uh, peninsular Spanish and the type of English I know, but each and every one uh, of the different interpreters, teaching interpreters, should reflect themselves whether this is valid or not, because I'm not saying this is the only way to go. So that's all. Thank you very much for listening to my tale of war. <laughs>
That's what Valerie Teller don't say, well, was well, what well, she well, said. I do, I do, I do believe saying. that it's the rendering. And by said, <coughs> we saw this last strategy once, in which there was, um, well, there was a, a meeting on wetlands, and there was a chairperson who was from uh, China with a very bloating English, because you don't even deal with English, you deal with bloating in all sorts of That's things. right, so that's it's, right. That's the point. Of course. So we try to speak their language in English words, in letter words. Not yeah. Not anymore referring to yeah. And I remember at that particular time, I tried to start to tell him you know, something about an elephant. And, and at some point, no one laughed because not even people who was listening to him directly. And I said, well, just please laugh because he was trying to make a joke. And the only people who laughed in the room were the Spanish speakers. Mm. <laughs> you tell <laughs> them to. Be nice, you see, to the chairperson. Yeah. But that's that's precise that's precisely my point because you are already um, giving some tipping points that I find very interesting. Uh, because precisely you're talking exactly the same way that you can do with translation. You're talking about over-explaining things or or a joke. But I'm I I, I don't know if I've been, I don't know if I've been aware, but I've very uh, carefully tried to avoid the word joke because humor are not only jokes. Uh, so that's why I'm saying that it's not the same. I th probably I think the most painful thing are trying to uh, interpret pans. That's a different thing, a pan, <laughs> right? Like, uh, why is 10 afraid of uh, 7? Because 7, 8, 9. Okay, there you have a joke and you have like, like, a, pan, like a homophone. And so that's basically probably one of the most difficult things to, to tackle. But you are given very good ideas in the sense that, yeah, maybe you have to over-explain. You have to, if, you, if we were in cinematic terms, you have to break the fourth wall. So now it's not longer the interpreter interpreting that person. But you're, you're, you're tapping somebody on the shoulder, please laugh. This, this is me. The interpreter is speaking to you, and you're just like, what are you talking about? Who, who's talking to me? But that person there. So, of course, as, as uh, Raskin said this morning, humor fails at all levels. For us as well. I'm not saying that we are going to uh, become into people that are capable of doing everything. We, we, we are, our craft is just a craft, and I'm as limited as I am. I mean, but the point is that how is it possible that so much has been written in translation studies with no repercussion or almost zero repercussion into interpreting studies makes no sense because it is difficult. You yourself have made a, a, a dissertation on it and if we go into neurolinguistics, 
uh, it, it's endless, endless. I, every time I have to read Cyril or Lakoff or anything, and everybody's discussing about whether irony could be understood or or uh, the CPs, no, no, this is not a violation of the corporate, corporation principle. It is, no, but it is not. Necessary. But you are all right. For God's sake, stop no, debating and discussing because you all have a point. What you don't have is a context. And that's what we do have in a booth. We have a context. But how do you explain that to students? Uh, no, you but see, that, no, 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 but that's precisely my point. You collect the sample of, you know, of mm -hmm. professional interpreters mm -hmm. seeing mm -hmm. different, different, uh, not even a corporate, because I'm not being so ambitious. I don't think you're going to be able to take so many examples. But let's take a sample. Let's take 20, 30 examples. Yeah. And then you see how professional interpreters cope at the need particular language combination. Yeah. And from there, you see what techniques they use. Because in the end, I think the interpreter techniques are always the same. Because humor yeah, is difficult, of course. But, uh, when people get angry, it's difficult. When people get yeah. poetic, it's different. When people give a quotation, yeah. it's, it's difficult. And you do need, I mean, there are very basic techniques that you apply, you know, like stop and listen. For instance, such, such, something as simple as that. So mm -hmm. why not do it the other way around? Why not take concrete examples, see how interpreters have coped with this? But that's that's a that's a wonderful suggestion and and um, yeah that was the original idea until my director very wisely said what is humor <clears throat> see see my point so the problem I I have decided to study the other way around okay as precisely me deciding what is humorous because everything is debatable actually it's also a matter of of uh, perception many times. That's what we have stated. So because my director said, okay, so what's humorous? Because you are going to choose what is humorous? And I said, you're right. That's a very tricky, uh, that's a very tricky question. So if I want to start with some corpus examples or way to go into that, first of all, I need to go for what experts in humor state that it is humor, right? Going the other way around. And um, I'm not, that's a wonderful idea, but as my battle is that, and I know that nobody supports me, at least not uh, when I was in the European Union last year in a course, a training for training course, and my teacher was looking at me like, saying, are you serious? <laughs> my uh, my uh, uh, hypothesis is that we have to start teaching our first year uh, students in interpreting uh, the concept of brushing shoulders with humor, not pants, for God's sake, on the first day, but exactly the same way that we do when we teach them how to approach figures. I don't know if this person said 1,532. So this person said more than 1,500. Perfect, that's fine. Mm -hmm. let, let us do the same about humor. So it's not about crushing against it, but living with it, and first of all, realizing that you cannot laugh because this joke is not intended for you to have fun, but you are, so all the time when I, when I do my, my classes, all the time I'm saying, don't laugh, because I'm usually making humorous remarks or telling jokes to ease the tension, you know how stressful it is. So, but I ask them, don't laugh, don't laugh. Okay, yes, I know that you're having fun, I, I hope so, that's my intention, but don't laugh. So rule number one, every time you hear something funny, or that you, f you personally find funny, don't laugh because you are not the aim. Secondly, what about the other way around? What about what you listen to is extremely, extremely harmful for you, but it is intended as a humorous remark by the speaker. So it's not about you judging whether you enjoy it or not because it's not for you and you have to I mean, as it happens with no matter what other type of, so I understand what you, what you mean, but going for professionals, for me, from, from my perception, is like moving away from my uh, aim, Prime, and my primary aim are students, because I just teach them what, this is what professionals do, what Nolan and uh, Taylor Bulletins, 
fantastic. That's perfect. That's one way to go. But I want, because for me, that would be like lazy. L lazy, if you, if you don't mind me saying this word. I, I only can come to some, or, or I am going to dare to propose several things because I've seen that, or I've done that myself. That's not good enough. I really want to see and, and make and be wrong and, 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 and ask for feedback and say, no, this is not working. But, but I would really like to propose exactly the same that they've done uh, through, through the different options and the different labeling and, and the different ideas they are presenting in, in cartoon or, or in audiovisual. Because probably they're not going to be exactly the same, but the sound may be similar. The lyrics may be different, but the, but the music <laughs> is, is, um, may be similar. But of course, I mean, um, this is a while, you know, I, I have nothing to base it upon but good intentions. And six years. Yeah, I've been, I've been standing for six years. I mean, I, I, I want to finish this year because I'm really going to die. I, I, need, I need to fin I mean, it's just a, a physical need. But, but, so, but thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And, and I'm so happy to see that someone has already read a dissertation on humor and interpreting because I couldn't find anything. So I'll, I'll, I'll be so happy to get in contact with you and learn so much from, from your own uh, study. But, but, you know, I, I came for all this time, I've, I've come from the opposite direction. So it's not about what professionals do. What can I do to make my students understand uh, how they may feel, which is, by the way, it's not 100%, this is going to be like that, there's going to function. We know, we know what we're talking about, but where there is nothing, nothing to cling to, to criticize, to say, ah, oh, this is old fashioned, this makes no sense. Okay, let's put it in black and white and see, let's see, let's see how they feel. Sorry. Anybody wants to pat my back? I'll understand that. Thank you. I teach consecutive. No, 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 you have a lot to say. You have a they lot to say. And they can explain, so we have some more time. But, but imagine that if but you're, you, you have to face, if you have to face a difficult humorous remark, I'm not going to say joke, and humorous remark, in consecutive, it can be even worse because you are supposed to have had the time, you are supposed to have had the time to think over. Exactly. So it's even worse. Come up with so brilliant ideas. Of course. <laughs> Use them. <laughs> how many of you professional interpreters, how many of you have been taught about how to face humor? However, we've done that. You've done well, that. You always receive that um, um, somehow. Like, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because oh, practice. You know what to do when yeah. you're putting up hours, fly, flying hours. Yeah, yeah but pra say, practice so, makes perfect. You Fine. Know what so. To do when the time when the time comes no. and you are in the booth and you are <laughs> terrified when they say, I'm going to send to tell <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, why have we done... We've done that. I know. I, I'm aware that we've done that. But is that enough? When you talk to the delegates and, or to the speakers and say, please, if you have some jokes or uh, humorous uh, situations or effects or whatever, please make sure it is not a pun, it is not based... On words because for Do they even know words, what is a pun? Say, Don't worry. Right. It's not based on words. And it's, <laughs> exactly it's only based on context. <laughs> it is only based on references. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unpredictable. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.